In today's show, the Blazers wrap up their pre-All-Star slate with a loss to the Minnesota Timberwolves. Where do they stand heading into the break and where do they go from here? Welcome to Locked On Blazers. Let's get into it. You are Locked On Trailblazers, your daily Portland Trailblazers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What up, world? It's your past first point guard and Trailblazers reporter, Mike Richmond. You're listening to another episode of Locked On Blazers, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, available wherever you get podcasts and also on YouTube. Thanks for making the show your first listen, coming at you each and every weekday, Monday through Friday. So start your days with it. Tell your friends to do the same. Make it your first listen. Locked On Blazers, your team every day. In today's show, we're checking in with the Blazers at the All-Star break. They're heading into All-Star weekend on a six-game losing streak. They lost to the Wolves. We'll talk about that game. Uh, we'll discuss the the final loss of the first, colloquially the first half. If you're a long-time listener to the program, you know they just finished up the long middle third of the season. Now two two thirds of the way through this thing with the with the final third remaining. We'll talk T Wolves game. We'll talk about where they are at the break statistically, and then I want to talk about seeing the vision, right? Because so much about this Blazers is what happens. This Blazers team and this Blazers season is about what happens next, not what happens now. So I want to spin it forward a little bit to close the show. Uh, let's that's what we'll do in the third segment. Let's let's do what we do though. Fastest recap in the West. Blazers lose one twenty eight ninety one. To the T Wolves, <laughs> it was bad early. It was bad early. The surprise in this one was that Scoot Henderson got the start. Uh, Blazers went with Scoot, Anthony Simons, Jeremy Grant, DeAndre Ayton, and Tumani Kamara. Um, we'll see what happens with Jabari Walker's starting spot. I thought he fit better next to Jeremy Grant, and answered some of their sort of questions in terms of rebounding. But Tumani Kamara is a better, you know, like defender against shifty players. So maybe it was specific to Anthony Edwards. Um, or maybe just Chauncey Billups just tweaking things all of the time, you know. It's um, but but that that was the group they went with. Scoot gets back in the starting lineup. Good, good. Play him a bunch. Let him ride. Like it's it it's it's time. It's time. Uh, not worrying about sinking or swimming. Just get them in the pool. And like I said, the pool was was perhaps perhaps too deep for the Blazers to begin this one. 44 14 after one. 44 to 14 after one. You really can't lose a game in one quarter. But it was over. It was over. The thing was, they were really they, they were really pesky in the second quarter to make this look like a basketball game. Um they scored 37 points in the second quarter. They, they outscored the T-Wolves by 15, 37-22. They cut the 30-point lead to 15 at the break. Uh Amphrey Simons, who had gone scoreless in the first quarter and had me looking up his uh, splits against Minnesota all season long of uh, spoiler not good but he had 11 and hit three three or four threes in the second quarter it's like okay Ant is finally finding a groove Jeremy Grant has nine in the second quarter it's like all right this you know what they're they're probably they're still down 15 this isn't like a great spot to be but this is um, at least respectable they cut it to eight early in the third quarter and you start to think like you know what you know what this the, the first quarter was so bad but this team has been tough all year long and I perhaps me alone here on my couch watching this game like perhaps I undersold them and then the T-Wolves just stepped on the gas and they led by 23 after three quarters and the fourth quarter the Blazers just could not score enough to make it even interesting final five minutes were garbage time and that uh, group scored five points in final five minutes uh, Blazers lose 128-91 that's your fastest recap in the west we don't need to go too much into the details of this game um I, I think the big thing is just like the T Wolves are the best defensive team in the NBA, and they looked like it. And they just took the Blazers out of what they wanted to do. Uh, in the first meeting, the Blazers, you know, they played the uh, T Wolves on Tuesday, and they played again, played them again on Thursday. Um, and according to Mark Stein of the Stein Line, typically um, this is the when you play a home set, um, your home court advantage is somewhat diminished. Um, and when you lose the first one, obviously your home court is, advantage is somewhat diminished, but. Um, it was going to be hard to get them after that start anyways, but the, like, um, you kind of, you said, you know, if the boys are going to win this game, they're going to win this game by hanging around and keeping it tough. When, when they had a cr- 
claw back from down 30. It had to be perfect. But I thought the T-Wolves were just like, they're so good on defense and they're so... They were so attentive to what they needed to do defensively um, that just like the Blazers kind of lack of weapons really showed up. They smothered Ant. Like he doesn't have a way to get free of Jaden McDaniels. He just doesn't know how to, how to handle that, um, that, pr- that length and that pressure. Um, and then they're really aggressive in, in staying attached on pick and rolls. And then they were, they came, they, DeAndre Ayton on Tuesday was really good against the T-Wolves. He made his first nine shots. He finished 10 of 11 from the floor. Excuse me, 11 of 12 from the floor. Like, he was just good. He was good. Um, like, and, and, and he got those, you know, sort of got himself into the middle areas and hit little nine, 10 footers and then got a couple roll to the rim dunks. And like, but he did his work, you know, mostly finding weak points in the drop coverage on pick and rolls. And the T-Wolves were just so freaking attentive to that. They were way up higher on the catch and way more aggressive on DeAndre. And he just wasn't good. He just wasn't good. Um, They took him out of it. He only had five shots. He went one of five and finished with two points. He fouled out with 10 and a half minutes to go in this game. Committed two fouls in like a 40-second span right at the beginning of the fourth quarter. Um, He starts the fourth quarter with four fouls. It's like, hey, if we're going to come back, we're down 23. If we're going to come back, we're going to do it with the dudes, you know, our, our best players on the court trying to make it happen. DeAndre picks up his fifth foul. Chauncey rolls with him. It's an offensive foul committed another foul on the other end 40 seconds bing bang boom his his night was done he finished with two points uh jeremy grant led the way with 20 but he didn't shoot very well six of 14 scoot anderson um 15 on five of 12 he was i I thought i don't think scoot was 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 that bad he wasn't that good but he wasn't that bad ant really struggled particularly early um he really struggled he finished with 12 points on four 15 shooting had five turnovers um i will say this to ant's credit he had a really nice second quarter offensively, and then he clearly was pissed because he played hard as hell on defense in the third quarter. He played, he really, 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 really clearly, like he was picking up full court, which he doesn't always do, but even just in the half court, he was up into his his um, his assignment and like really being physical and 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 playing um, playing at a sort of a effort level on defense that you don't always see from him. He was and the physicality that you don't always see from him. He was. Um, clearly he was motivated by how he had been struggling and how they'd been treating him, right? Like he got a tech in the first half and was angry about a foul call. He went, he went and tried to, um, you know, he played, he played in a sort of a defensive intensity that we rarely see from him. And he, before he checked out in the third quarter for his normal rest, the Blazers were kind of in the game. Um, and then he went to the bench and uh, it just, <laughs> the, the, the thing fell apart really quickly. Um, it wasn't just because like Matisse Thibel came in for him, but it was at the time that Matisse Thibel came in for Ant and that, um, and, and things really, you know, things really went south in a hurry um, after, after Ant checked out in the th- third quarter, but I don't think he was good in this game. So I don't like, I don't think um, it wasn't like he was going to save him, but he went to his credit. He did play hard as heck in his stretch in the third quarter. Um, Blazers still don't have an answer for Anthony Edwards. He's really stinking good. He had, he had 34, um, 17 for McDaniels after a scoreless night. Jaden McDaniels had 17 after a scoreless night. Uh, Carl Anthony Towns had a, had a rough night on Tuesday. He comes back and has 23, uh, 11 and 12 for Rudy Gobert, who's just he's just a really good defensive player. Um, and this was just uh, you know the T Wolves got 12 or 10 from uh, Nas Reed. Nikhil Alexander Walker, who killed the Blazers on Tuesday, didn't do anything, and 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 they just rolled. Uh, T Wolves shot 51 percent from the floor. Blazers just a, a cool 37, including. 28 percent from three eight of 29 if you're gonna miss threes in the league particularly for the blazers because um like they're they they're not they don't generate a lot of easy offense if you're gonna miss shots you're going to it's gonna be tough for you um in general, like this was a beat down. Like this is a beat down. I, I don't mean to dismiss the fact that it was that I'm not trying to tell you that they didn't get a walloped or anything like that, but um yeah, like the T-Wolves are just way better than them. And I think they're you're you kind of when you get to this point in the season, there's no secrets anymore. Like the Blazers are not a good team and the T-Wolves are a really good team, and that's what it looked like tonight. Um let let's talk about kind of where the Blazers are though, because I, I think that um I think that's really the key is is what where they are and where they go from here. That's what we'll talk about in the second segment. Uh, before we do that, though, I want to tell you about eBay Motors. 
my friend Josh. He has got some fantasy picks for you because he has teamed up with the good folks at eBay Motors. Joshy, that's Josh Lloyd, Locked, host of Locked on Fantasy Basketball, bringing you the best fantasy picks each week, all season long, whether you're prepping for daily fantasy or you're scouring the waiver wire for the stretch run of your season-long fantasy team. Right here, I'm going to provide you with the players that are guaranteed to fit your roster. Let's see who Josh has picked out for us for this week's eBay Guaranteed Fit of the Week. How about a couple young guys with some opportunities to step up down the stretch? Two guys that I'm giving you two. I'm supposed to go one, but I'm going to go two this week for you. Uh, Asar Thompson for the Pistons, uh, you know, they've they've overhauled the roster and he's going to get some opportunity to play for the Pistons down the stretch back into a larger role. Um, you know, he he doesn't score, but he provides pretty much all of the other stats in, 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 in your categories. Um, he's going to rack up defensive stats. He's going to rebound. He can pass. Um, and, and with a big minute role, he might be an interesting value add down the stretch. And the other young guy who's, who's um, maybe going to get a bigger role down the stretch and could be worth a flyer here as we head into the stretch run is Taylor Hendricks. You know, Simone Fontecchio, he plays for the Pistons now. Kelly Olenek, he's a, he's a Toronto Raptor, and that means Hendricks was a top 10 pick last year. He could get a larger role down the stretch. Now, I will say on Thursday evening while I'm recording this particular program, Hendricks didn't get a larger role, but when you're looking for an edge in fantasy, you got to take, you sometimes got to find these guys before they pop, and nobody's better at finding guys before they pop than Josh. So, Asar Thompson, Taylor Hendricks, Hendricks, check them out. They are your fantasy players of the week. Josh Lloyd's going to help you do it all season long. He's going to help you guide you to a championship. And eBay Motors knows that a championship team is about each player being a perfect fit. It's the same with your vehicle. With over 122 million parts to choose from for your number one ride or die, you can make sure that that ride stays running smoothly. So whatever you're looking for, brake kits, LED headlights, roof racks, bumpers, whatever your baby needs, eBay Motors has it. And with eBay guaranteed, eBay's guaranteed fit, it's guaranteed to fit your ride the first time, every time, or your money back. Plus, these prices, you're burning rubber, baby, not cash. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. It's eBay guaranteed fit, only available to U.S. customers. Ex- uh, exclusions apply. All right. Let's... Let's talk a little bit about where the Blazers are at the break. Um, you know, you lose the you lose the D Wolves. They got smacked around a little bit, but um, I would say let let's check in and then I'll tell you what I'll say. At the break, and these numbers are according to Cleaning the Glass, the indispensable stats website from Ben Falk. The Blazers are 29th on offense. The thing, the best thing they do on offense by far is they they get offensive rebounds. They're, you know, they're a bad shooting team. They're last in the league in effective field goal percentage, which accounts for the value of three-pointers. They're last in the league in true shooting percentage, which accounts for the value of three-pointers plus the value of free throws. They shoot bricks. This team shoots bricks. <laughs> they are what they are. Um, but the thing that they do best is go get those bricks. Um, they they are fifth in the league in offensive rebound rate. They give themselves second chances. Now, they, don't, they are the worst half-court offense in the league, and they're bottom three in the league in transition frequency. They don't score in the half-court, and they don't run. They... Um, um, and they're one of the bottom teams in the league in assist percentage, like and second to last in assist percentage. They make it hard on themselves. They don't push in transition for easy buckets. They don't share the ball particularly well. They're also last in assist percentage because they shoot bricks. But they're also near the bottom of the league in just like raw passing. They, um, their, their, their offense is pretty darn clunky. But they make up for it by getting offensive boards. That's the thing they do best by far on offense. It's the thing, it's the thing that, that makes them, um, when they are good, giving themselves second chance opportunities and making three-pointers. And and really, it's it's those second chance points. Like, um, that that is that is kind of what fuels their offense when, when it's even remotely competitive. And again, they're 29th in the league on offense. But that's the thing they do best, is give themselves second chance opportunities. On defense, they are in the bottom third of the league and in, in, uh, effective field goal percentage teams can score, have been able to score against them down the stretch. They foul a little too a bit too much bottom five in the league in foul rate. And, um, the thing they do best by far, you know, they, they give up buckets, they give up made buckets and they, and they get crushed on the offensive on the defensive glass. They don't finish possessions by getting rebounds. They're good at getting extra possessions and terrible at finishing possessions with offensive rebounds, um, by giving up too many offensive rebounds. It is what it is. The thing they do best on defense, the thing that fuels them is that they force turnovers. It's been what, when they were good, when they were really good on defense to begin the year, some of it was kind of, um, you know, three-point magic. But they were the best team in the league at forcing turnovers. They've slipped all the way down to just the fourth best team at, at forcing turnovers. It's who they are. They play an aggressive style of defense um, where they, 
They press pretty much more than any other team in the league, but also like they switch everything and they're aggressive on switches. They, they're not crazy with like blitzing and double teaming, but they want to put pressure, a hard pressure away from the rim. And some of their switching principles mean like you stay up and you go get the ball. Not these, like they, they concede the switch pretty easily, but they, they kind of catch the ball. They want to catch the ball up high. And by catch the ball, I mean like stop the ball handler up high. Um, and they're fourth in the league enforcing turnovers. The best thing they do on 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 defense by far is for, is force turnovers. The best thing they do on offense by far is get offensive rebounds. But they're 29th and 0 and 29th on D or 24th on D. Like this is it's a bad basketball team, right? Like that's why they have the fifth worst record in the league. It's why they're they have lost six games in a row. They're incredibly young. They're incredibly young. Even their veterans are young, right? Like, um, and and they've been beat up by injuries that probably would have allowed them to be a little bit better this year. But it is what it is. Like you don't. Injuries are part of the game. It happens. Um, like you don't you don't get a you don't get a mulligan. You just they just this is this is the situation they're in, and it might not get that much easier. They got the sixth hardest um, strength of schedule after the All Star break. That's just like raw opponent win percentage. I didn't look at one of those things that charts travel and all of those things, but like just in terms of opponents win percentage, the their opponents they're they're the sixth toughest schedule remaining in the league just in terms of playing good teams so got to play the Celtics twice like it's it's going to get bumpy for them um I I think like an undeniable positive of this team is that for the most part they play hard for the most part they play hard when they lose and when they have lost it's because they're just they lack skill they're just a little light on talent. Like I don't think they've lost games often because they let go of the rope or they or they quit or they don't play hard. Like certainly there has been some of those times where it feels like, huh, they didn't really bring it tonight. And sometimes they bring it more than this. And I think in the final five minutes of this game, um, with when they were on the court, I thought Scoot Henderson was kind of dogging it a little bit. Quite frankly, I don't think he was playing as hard as he could have. Um, but that has been that was like notable to me because I was like, hmm, I rarely see Scoot like walk on the court like I, I, I rarely see him play where it's like where it feels like they they play defeated I, I will say to to Chauncey Billups's credit um as much as I think his his offense is a little bit too vanilla and sometimes he he, he demands that they play a certain way that doesn't make sense square peg round hole type of thing but like the dudes play hard for him they seem to like him um that doesn't mean that their offense is good or their defense has been particularly effective or that they've won more games than they maybe should have. They've kind of gotten the exact sum out of the parts that you would expect, which has been the sort of the signature of these teams over the last three seasons is, is give them a bad roster, or give you a bad record. But like they do, they do as a, as like a general positive, they do play really hard and they're extremely young and they're extremely new. Like this, like, Jabari Walker is the, one of the longest tenured players on the roster. He's a second year player who was a second round pick last season. Uh, you know, Amphrey Simons is far and away the longest tenured player on the team by like, uh, by three, 200%, right? Excuse me, 300% rather. Like it's, it, <laughs> he's, it, he's, it's, it is a, it is certainly they've played um, a lot of games together now, but it's like they've, They've been, they've had injuries. They're really young and they're really new. Kind of thought they might be here. Um, so I, I, well, I, well, I think that is like an maybe a Homerish band aid to say, well, at least they play hard. I, I, I do earnestly think at least they play hard. I mean, like I, this team would be so much more frustrating if they didn't bring it with energy and they were like, you know, punching Drew Eubanks in the back hallway before a game started. They're not messy. They're just not very talented. And that's, I think that's the, 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 the thing that strikes me about this team. They're just, they just like, they just can't shoot and they don't have enough players who can really defend and they're light in the front court, like in terms of what, like being able to play multiple looks and go have like actually truly big lineups out on the court. And they have this, they have a collection of young wings, but none of them are particularly good enough to like truly beat out the others. They're all flawed in some different type of way. And like, um, they're, they're, a, they're a team still figuring it out. So what I want to do to close the show is talk about what does the vision look like? Cause at the break, like, I don't think this should be a surprise to you, right? They're the fifth worst record in the NBA. Um, prior to the season, I went on a locked on, I had a, we did a locked on preview across the whole network and I was invited with four other teams to do, 
to talk about what it's going to be like to cover one of the worst teams in the league. The, the Wizards, the Spurs, the Hornets, and the Pistons. Those are the four other hosts that would join me on that particular program. Um, guess who the five worst teams in the league are this year? Like... This is exactly what it was supposed to be. Um, I don't think the record, I, I would say, and generally speaking, I'm not worried about the record. I'm not worried about the offense. I'm not worried about the defense in terms of ranking and, and all of that stuff. Like, this is what I thought they would be. What I want to talk about, though, is like, what's next? What's next? And I want to try to see if we can squint and see the vision. That's what we'll do to close the show. Come squint with me. But first, let me tell you all about Robin Hood. Did you know that if even if you got a 401k for retirement, you can still have an IRA? Robin Hood has the only IRA that gives you a 3% boost on every dollar you contribute when you, when you subscribe to Robin Hood Gold. But get this, now through April 30th, Robin Hood is even boosting every single dollar you transfer in from other retirement accounts with a 3% match. That's right, no cap on the 3% match. Robin Hood Gold gets you the most for your retirement thanks to their IRA with a 3% match. This this offer is good through April 30th, so get started at Robinhood.com slash boost. Subscription fees apply. And now for that legal info. Claim of Q1 2024 validated by Radius Global Market Research. Investing involves risk, including loss. Limitations apply to IRAs and 401ks. 3% match requires Robinhood Gold f- for for one year from the date of the first 3% match. Must keep Robinhood IRA for five years. The 3% matching on transfers is subject to specific terms and conditions. Robinhood IRA available to U.S. customers in good standing. Robinhood Financial LLC, member SIPC, a registered broker dealer. Still a pass first point guard. I'm still Mike Richmond, and you are still listening to Locked On Blazers. I think where the Blazers are is that they're a, a not particularly good young team. I think that's exactly where we thought it would be. I think there is there is no reason, based on sort of the small picture stuff, to freak out about this team. I think it would be inappropriate. Um, it's not my style anyways, but like I think um, nothing about their record or, or, or that gives me great, a great deal of pause or anxiety or reason to be upset. The things that give me some concern are much larger picture stuff. And I think the problem with, or not the problem is not the right word, my concern with where they are and and, and, and what's next is mostly about not being able to um, clearly see the picture. I don't really know what's on the other side of the hill. I got a guess. I bet on the other side of the hill, Scoot Henderson and Shaden Sharp play in the backcourt together. That's my guess. But I don't even know which freaking hill it is. There's a lot over on the horizon. There's a lot of paths to cross. And Portland chose to sit out the all- or sit out the trade deadline, right? They they made one minor trade to Delano Banson, uh, a fun player who I like. Uh, but like, they don't, they chose to sit out the trade deadline probably for pragmatic reasons, right? Because they weren't they weren't really shopping everyone on the roster, right? They didn't want to trade Amphrey Simons. They didn't want to trade Jeremy Grant. They weren't super keen on trading Malcolm Brogdon unless they got a good deal, and the deal wasn't there, right? And if you look across the trade deadline, and I mentioned this in many prior shows, it's like there wasn't like a bunch of first-round picks flying around, and it wasn't a bunch of high-level movement flying around. The good players got traded early in the season. James Harden and, and Damian Lillard got traded right at the beginning of the season. Pascal Siakam got traded right you know, before the deadline, OG Ananobi and stuff. Like, on deadline day, there just there wasn't that kind of action, right? Not that Malcolm Brogdon is in that conversation, but in terms of like, a, if you're hoping to get a first round pick, there just there weren't that many that moved, changed hands, right? So perhaps it was pragmatic. The Blazers didn't uh, move Brogdon at the deadline, right? He's good. You want to get a good return for him if you do move him and um, you don't need to trade him. You don't need to chase a bad deal. But by, but by choosing not to do that, right? And again, it might be the right move, but by choosing not to do that, they did nothing with the roster, essentially. And the, the challenge of doing nothing is that this year hasn't given us the data that you would hope to have received. And a lot of that is just Shaden Sharp's been hurt. 
But the whole sort of point of this season, right, was to see Scoot and Shaden and Shaden and Ant and and Ant and Scoot and and look at that guard trio and have them play as much as they possibly could and find out what duos work, what duos don't work. Is is the Scoot and Ant thing even remotely viable? I can't imagine that it is. I don't think there's a version, a good version of the Blazers moving forward. Ramfrey Simons plays basically any minutes at shooting guard, but. You know that's a big conversation for down the line. They it's not like they need to trade him this summer, but they that that decision will have to come at some point, probably. But this time next year, that decision will have to be made one way or another. They're going to have to figure out if they're going to um, Tyrese Halliburton, Scoot Anderson, if they're going to Monte Ellis, uh, uh, Anthony Simons. But like so much of the my my inability to see the other side of the hill is probably just Shaden Sharp hasn't played. Because if he had played, it would be like, yeah, he's pretty darn good. Or it's like, oh, he's freaking great. Or it's like, you know what? He's He is not quite that. He's going to be a good player, but he's not quite that. But you can't really build forward in a rebuild unless you have that strong foundation and that you need a foundational piece. And the Blazers just don't have that. They don't have that. They have a lot of uncertainty. Um what they desperately need is like a really good forward to, to sort of anchor an intriguing guard core. And they need some backup bigs to play behind DeAndre Aiden. In theory, they have that with Robert Williams, but he might just be theoretical more than functional just because of his health issues. Um, they have so many, they have a glut of young wings that just aren't quite there and look like they're more role players than anything else moving forward. Interesting role players like Tamani and, and uh, Kamara and Jabari Walker and, and, and maybe Chris Murray becomes that as well. But like, you know, not not that tier of, of player you get you get there with, which means this summer has so many big decisions ahead of them and a really narrow window to get it done. And I think a lot of teams are banking on this summer being sort of a high movement summer, and perhaps it will be. But I feel like I've sat and, and talked in this microphone and said a lot of times, well, the next cycle for trading and drafting is really big. Okay, the off season's really big. Okay, the trade deadline's really big. And and obviously the Blazers have made some you know, massive structural trades under Joe Cronin, but it's mostly going the other way. It's getting worse and cheaper. Um, the, like the cycle to build up, we still haven't, you know, they've, they've made some draft picks, but they haven't, um, you know, they're, they're young, they're teenagers and 20 year olds and, and Sharp's been injured. He's played 35 games this year. Um, so like, it's just hard to see the vision. It's hard to see what comes next. It's like I said, it's pretty, reasonable to guess what is on the other side of the hill but nothing about what has happened this season makes you feel like really strongly comfortable on the next really good blazer team looks like this because scoot anderson is started slow and looks better recently for sure but does he look like he has obvious all nba upside i don't think so but he's been way better recently and when the flash is flash for, for Shaden Sharp. He looks like he can be really special, but part of the challenge of good players is consistency, and he hasn't been that. Um, whether that's injury or growing pains or a combination of the two, he hasn't been that. And I think Avery Simons has pretty clearly, um, to me, shown himself to be capable, but not the not a foundational element that can you can build around. A good basketball player, to be sure, but not that foundational element. The Blazers are still searching. And so, who knows what's on the other side of the hill? If I squint, I can find the hill. I can find several hills. But I can't see the clear path. And part of me worries that that is the challenge of the rest of this season, is that there's no clarity coming. Because Shaden Sharp's not going to come back and play, and you're just still going to be just kind of the team that you are, and you're going to go into the offseason with not as many questions answered as you wanted. But one of the things that I recommend when possible, is to hold on to your joy. So in this moment, I'm going to invite you to do something. You guessed it. Don't worry about the hill. The hill will come. They'll find the hill. They might find the wrong hill. They might find the right hill. Who knows? But they will get to the other side. Big decisions are looming for this team. In fact, they're going to have to make some moves just to be cheaper next year because they're looking like they're going to be a tax team. And they're not going to pay the tax to be the quality of team that they are. Like they've set themselves up basically to have to make moves. The hill is coming. So here's what I want to invite you to do. You're listening to Friday, February 16th show. This evening at 6 p.m. on TNT and also streaming on NBA.com. The Blazers' best rookie is going to play in the Rising Stars game. 
So instead of worried about the hill and the direction and what's on the other side, something that is admittedly hard to squint and see, turn the TV on, fire up your web browser of choice, and watch Scoot Henderson play in a midseason showcase that celebrates good young players. For a night, watch a meaningless showcase of, hey, this guy's good and might be really good in the future. Just give yourself a chance to enjoy a fun, meaningless game. Because the big questions remain unanswered, and when we get back from the All-Star break, they will largely remain unanswered. Nothing's going to happen between now and when the Blazers play again that answers the sort of massive structural questions facing this team. So the best thing you can do as a fan is have fun in the moment. Watch Scoot play in Indianapolis in Friday's game. Enjoy what he brings and enjoy what he might be because the best thing you can do if you are listening to this program at this time of year on freaking Friday in February is hold on to your joy. Appreciate what's in front of you right now, the thing that's right there now because if you worry too far and onto the horizon, you just get lost and you might pick the wrong hill. The hill will come. The path will, will eventually reveal itself. For now, enjoy what you got. Tell your friends about the program. Come back next week. We'll do five more shows of these. Got some fun things lined up for All-Star Break. You are going to want to come back. Still doing five shows next week, Monday through Friday. Join me there. Tell a friend. I appreciate you listening. I'll talk to you soon.